So the title the Lord gave me was The Dawning of God's Kingdom Regeneration. And uh, that word regeneration is found in Scripture, but it's not something that you hear too often. So that's, that's one good reason to think about it. It must be in there for a reason. And I also want to continue to keep your mind focused on the fact that next uh, Sunday is Pentecost Sunday and that we celebrate that because you should think about the calendar that we're on. And, and there were seven weeks in between the resurrection and, and when the Holy Spirit was, was given by the Lord. And that lines up with the Old Testament because there were seven weeks plus a day, right? You know that it's 50 days. Pentecost, penta means 50. Seven weeks plus one day. That was the year of Jubilee in the Old Testament. But when the Israelites came out of Egypt for Passover, it was seven weeks and a day later when God gave Moses the law. Okay, so this is... What I said earlier, Holy Spirit is given to us as a supercharger on top of the Word of God to let us know how to live our lives every day. And it's something I think that we could all probably agree with, that we don't like religious spirits, right? What do you think of when I say a religious spirit? It's not a positive compliment, is it? And sometimes you'll hear people, that, uh, like on my job, they'll say, oh, you're really religious, aren't you? And like you want to say, well, I know what you mean, but you can't get into this big, long explanation. They're saying it as a compliment, but we're thinking, well, it's not a religion didn't get me saved. A relationship got me saved, right? But, you know, meet people where they're at, however you choose to do that. You can always plant another seed for the Lord. One plants, another waters, God gives the increase, right? So the dawning of God's kingdom regeneration, and the dawning word there, I'll tie in a little bit to scripture too, but think about who was the first person that saw the resurrected Jesus? Mary. It says, out of whom Jesus had cast seven spirits. Wow. Like, what an honor that she has in scripture in this amazing arc of history that somebody who would have been thrown on the society trash heap was given the honor because she loved him so much she was bringing the oil. So, the, so that, that's what they did then, right? They didn't bury people underground. They, they waited until their body decomposed, which is why they would bring the perfume. And then with the, put the bones in a bone box, they called it. And she was going there. Even though she thought he was gone, she hadn't forgotten her love and the, the appreciation she had. So we'll talk about that for a minute. But it's, it's, a, it's about this idea that regeneration is regenesis. Think of it that way. A new start, an ability to lose the old part and get started up again and get regenerated. We don't use that word that often, but it's a great concept. And, and Titus is the verse where uh, you see this, one of the two places in the New Testament where you see it. It says, Jesus, he came to save us. Anybody say amen to that? Did you need to be saved? Oh, do you know anybody who needs to be saved? Do they know it? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. He poured out a spirit on all flesh. It's not that we earned it by doing good works or righteous deeds. You know, that's true. He came because he's merciful. It wasn't like he was sitting in heaven just waiting and like, okay, you finally did all the right deeds. You followed it all correctly. Now I can come down and save you. No, it's mercy. His mercy triumphs over his judgment. You could say it. Come on. You could say it. It's good. He came because he's merciful. Why would he love me? I didn't earn it. I, I wasn't lovable. I, I was a very crunchy kind of person that you wouldn't want to be around. He brought us out of our old ways of living to a new beginning through the washing. Say it with me. Through the washing of regeneration. Amen. Helps if you could read in this church. So I'll try to keep it up there for you. Through the washing of regeneration. And if you just think about your own salvation, what changed when you got saved? It would be a pretty long list, wouldn't it? Pretty long list. That's part of that regeneration. But it doesn't just happen when you get saved. It's meant to continue happening for the rest of your time here on earth that this regenerative process keeps on doing what we sang and, and talked about this morning. The word that came forth was that God was asking us to be available, to be pruned. And you don't get a lot of amens on pruning, right? But you get, more, you get more amens on regeneration. 
So what's so bad about cutting off the dead branches and putting them in the fire or taking the chaff and separating it out and putting that on the fire because the chaff isn't doing you any good. It's slowing you down. So I'll give you the rest of this because it says, he brought us out of our old ways of living to a new beginning through the washing of regeneration and he made us completely new through the Holy Spirit. All right, that's a powerful combo the, the washing and then a completely new spirit in you because you now have God's spirit in you. So the, the logical question is, if he's in us, why, how come I'm still doing what Paul said? How come the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I end up doing? That's the dilemma that we have. Well, if he's in here, maybe we're just not yielding to him to the degree that we need to. And, and that's because it's painful to, to let that old chaff go. It's painful to be pruned until you know, like an athlete, right, you can, no pain, no gain, or pay me now or pay me later. If you don't want to get in shape for the fight, Mike Tyson's going to knock your head off, right? So if you're getting in the ring with Mike, you know, and the devil can be compared to a, a pretty good fighter. He knows how to lie. So if I expect to win spiritual warfare, I better be ready. I better equip myself. I, I can't be perfect, but I can be being transformed into his image, and I could be like David, a man, come on, after God's own heart. Not perfect, but somebody who's pursuing after God. That would be the goal. Who was poured out, the Holy Spirit now, was poured out in abundance through Jesus, the anointed, our Savior. I'll just remind you again, because I said once Jesus ascended, he said to Mary in the garden, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended. But then later, before before Pentecost, he's in the upper room and he says to Thomas, oh, I heard you wanted to touch my wounds. Come on down. Put your finger right in here. Nah, I'm good, Lord. I'm good. I don't need to touch. I believe it now. <laughs> and right, blessed are those who see and believe, but how about those who don't see and believe? Amen. That's us. Well, maybe not. Maybe some of you have seen the Lord. And this is the language in Matthew 28. I love Matthew. I have developed such a love for his gospel since I uh, was preaching more. And, and I really dug into the depths of, of this man. What, a, what an unbelievable ability to link all of these Old Testament scriptures together in the gospel of Matthew. And he says it this way, dawn was breaking on the first day of the week. That's such a packed statement. This is the first day of the week, Sunday, today, right? We don't think of it that way in our culture, but it, this is how it works. Sunday's the first day. Monday's the second day. And why we meet on Sunday morning is because it's the day of the resurrection. It's when Jesus' mission on the earth, that stage of it, was completed. And he had to ascend to the Father and bring his blood and put the blood on the mercy seat in heaven. That was the final aspect of his ascension. And then he could sit down at the right hand of the Father. And then 50 days later, Holy Spirit is released. It is finished. That old cycle of death is finished now, and we get to live in this period between his ascension and his final return. And there's a bunch of, I know, understand the book of Revelation, all kinds of things that could happen between now and his final return, but I'm just asking you to think about the final return. Not all the different versions of the way people have rightly developed what could happen between now and then. I want to focus on when he comes back for good because that's when we're going to rule and reign with him forever. If there's a thousand years of tribulation in the meantime, whatever, however all that works, I can only handle today. I try to keep it pretty simple, right? Today, I want to live more for you today, Lord. And if I knew you were coming back tomorrow, that shouldn't change anything about how I live my life. I should still, I'm not going to eat the ice cream because I get, because I'm going to be gone tomorrow. I normally don't eat sugar. So, you know, this is what we do. Come up with all these formulas in our brain. It wasn't just the first day of the week. It was the first day of the it is finished dispensation. Because he didn't defeat death on the cross. He defeated death when he came out of the grave. If he hadn't come out of the grave, the cross wouldn't have mattered. This is what Paul says. So this was the dawn, not just of the first day of the week, but a whole new way of life being lived. A whole hope that we have now that we can talk to other people and not just count on Einstein intellect. How many people have that intellect? And when they do, doesn't that slow them down sometimes from, from walking in faith? That couldn't possibly be the only way to get saved, is to have to win arguments with people. 
it's, it's great to be an apologist and to understand all of the, under, you know, the, the logic behind why we believe what we believe, but it's a demonstration of the power that gets people saved as well as a great presentation of the gospel. Amen? So it was breaking on the first day of the week. So that's why I said the dawning of God's kingdom regeneration. Once he finished that cycle of death, there was a whole new dispensation that would be added to 50 days later when Holy Spirit was coming, which is next week for us. It was also one of the three major times in the year that everybody was expected to be back in Jerusalem for the feasts. And they would bring an offering for that feast. So you might want to consider that. My wife reminded me, too, that we just entered into the new month of Nisan. And all the amazing, I'm sorry, Sivan, I'm, my bad, Sivan. I guess it was a, a car analogy in my brain. Oh, there's too much in there. <laughs> Glad you corrected me. And, and it's, a, it's about abundance. It's about the law coming. It's about Holy Spirit. It, you know, all of the victories that happened in this season. It's really good to think about that. So it's, it's the other portion of Scripture is in Matthew 19 that he uses this word. He surely, I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me, anybody here? You have followed me? You following Jesus? Okay. We'll also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, or lands for me, what? shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And often that's difficult because you're giving up a lot to serve the Lord. And if you think it's hard here in our culture today, it was much harder for the Jews. You might remember when the blind man was healed, his parents were afraid to say something because they didn't want to be cast out of the community of the Jews, right? That's, that's the kind of thing the Pharisees were doing. So I just wanted to make this real for you for today. Uh, we have a young lady in our church who's a freshman in high school right now. She's a really good athlete, great soccer player, and probably, you know, all, all things being equal, no injuries, will, you know, be good enough to be able to get a, a scholarship someday. I had a scholarship to play football when I was in high school. It's an amazing thing to be so good at your sport that they're willing to pay all your tuition for you. Right? So this, I just wanted you to see the language behind what happened. And she's now applying to a Christian high school to go to next year. And the wording really stuck with me. And I printed it out and put it up you know, in my office so that I could see it and be reminded of it. She's talking about now to this Christian school and the application about what happened when she became a Christian. Over time, my, sp my perspective of life has changed drastically. I've been, in the past, surrounded by unhealthy conversations and ways of living which caused me to feel uneasy. Lately, I've needed a fresh start to be in a community of people that share the same love for God that I do, and to be able to relate to people my age and have conversations about the Word. While I, don't want, well, I'm sorry, while I do want to grow academically, I also am seeking to grow spiritually, which I believe can happen here. I want to be able to go to a fellow classmate for prayer or to talk about my struggles, and that's not something I've been able to do. I was not able to do that either because I didn't know the Lord when I was in high school, and the people that were talking to me were, if I heard the name Jesus, it was a swear word. They weren't inviting me to Bible studies. Didn't, didn't have any clue. Thought it was all fake religion. But how valuable that this age that she's writing this it's real to her, right? I haven't been able to do that. Ever since I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, my eyes have opened. And I don't love the things I loved before. I don't participate in conversations I would have participated in before. All of this has left me wanting a change. I'd let her in. I don't know about you, but I'd let her in. <laughs> That's what I mean by the dawning See, that's, that's an example of what it's like for that light to go on. And there's this dawning of God's kingdom regeneration. And again, I'm just going to repeat it, that when we get saved, that's the beginning, but not the end. There's a continual regeneration for the rest of our time here on earth. And could be, I'll extend it, even for eternity, because we are going to rule and reign with him for eternity. I don't think we stop growing during that period. Discipleship to Christ means not just salvation, but growing more and more into his character 
every day. And when that happens, these kind of testimonies come forth. Whatever that happened in her heart that caused that to happen, it's different for everybody, but God is drawing people, and we are the ones in the middle that make a difference. Amen? You all with me so far? All right. So I'll give you another example. My wife and I happened to see a movie, and um, you probably remember that, uh, well, I'll just give you the quote from Isaiah 6, 8, whom shall I send, right? You might remember that. In Thailand in 2018, there was a boys' soccer team that was trapped in an underground cave. Well, the movie we saw was unbelievably good at telling this story. I, I, the, the name Trapped is in there somewhere. I don't remember the full title. And uh, all 12 boys and their coach survived, but the rescue took 18 days. So basically, they went from practice on their way home. They said, hey, let's stop at the cave on the way back. And they kind of, you know, got into it with each other, and they were using their flashlights and going down into the cave. And all of a sudden, a monsoon rain just hits the area in Thailand where they are. Like, you, they got trapped in there because the water was coming in so fast that they had to find a place where they could where they could land, but they're two miles away from the surface. No oxygen, well, I mean, whatever oxygen's down there, no lights, no electricity, whatever food they had. Huh. Anybody remember this? Watching it on the news? It was like a, a, a worldwide news story, right? And I thought it was interesting, 12 disciples and their coach, <laughs> right? 18 days, 18 days, like that's a long time, because just because they ended up, obviously, it's a happy ending, they all survived, but finding them wasn't the end of the story, how do you get them out, because there's still so much water, you could never pump all the water out that's in there in time, mm. it's not today's full message, but think about this, they were rescued by a brilliant team of volunteers and military divers. That is another part of the story that I don't have time to get into today, but it was the fact that they all worked together. And there were some very unconventional ways that they said, you know what, we're going to have to try something that's a little bit out of the ordinary. If we want to make this happen, I'll just leave it at that. And if they didn't have leadership that was willing to just go with the flow and recognize what a horrible situation this is, they, those kids probably, and the coach probably would have died. I know, I know, there's so many analogies here because why are we here? The church, what are we doing here? Right? Yes, we got saved, but isn't there supposed to be a purpose for the kingdom for our lives while we're here before we leave? Instead of just saying, well, Lord, hurry up and get down here, it's a mess. I want my mansion. I want streets of gold. No more tears, no more pain. <laughs> Can eat ice cream all day and I won't gain weight. This is how people think. <laughs> Chubby hubby. Yeah, that's one of the flavors. Chubby hubby. What a great name, my God. I wish I could say that all the volunteers made it out, but they didn't. One of the retired Navy SEALs. Why would you help them? Why would you risk your life? He was a Navy SEAL. Like This was not some slouch. He, he so extended himself that he ran out of oxygen on the way back. You know, and he died a martyr. Why? He wasn't getting paid. This is just what we do. This is how humanity pulls together. When we see that there's this emergency going on, they rallied people from all over the world to go there to try to help get these kids out because we can all relate, right? And this guy should have made it no problem. He, he had done this for years, and he was retired now, but he was still in great shape. When, when you look him up, he was still a marathon runner. And I'm not trying to belabor the point, but I think this is part of why we're here is to try to make a difference between the day we get saved and the day we meet him face to face, whatever that means. What it means for me could be a little bit different for you, specifics, but the goal should all be the same. And I like to say any kingdom has a currency. You know that, right? Because if you go overseas and 
they, they want to use a different coin. You can't spend your dollars. But it's a dollar. We don't care. We don't accept a dollar. You need a peso or whatever. Well, what's the currency of God's kingdom? I'm sure there's a lot of answers for that. But I've been in finance my, most of my career. So I, I see it as changed lives. The currency of the kingdom is how many lives were changed because you were here. And you used the time that you had between when you got saved and when you met the Lord. But there's real, that's a very hard way to measure, isn't it? Because it's not just how many lives changed, it's how much those lives changed. So somebody who comes in, a, a drug addict, junkie, you know, ready to die, and transforms completely and turns their life around, that's a changed life. <laughs> who else could do that? Right? Who else could do that? But the Lord, we sang it over and over again today. You're the only one that could have done that. But I can't wake up trying to get another notch in my gun of getting another person saved. It's got to be real. It's got to be a life-transforming experience. And if I think I can do it, I've failed already. Because I have to rely on him to do it through me. But we often want to get the credit for stuff. That's just part of our culture here, isn't it? So I, I saw another picture of him, and I cut it out and taped it to my computer screen so I wouldn't forget this hero. Wasn't paid a nickel went on his own time and lost his life trying to save these people. Well, I mean, that's an analogy to Jesus. Not only did we not pay him back, they were spitting on him. They were pulling out his beard. They were beating him to a pulp, mocking him. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame. Now, I, I'm just going to say, I think sometimes we forget that we're supposed to be doing what he was doing. Right. We're supposed to be extending ourselves out to the lost. He doesn't want one person to perish, right? So Holy Spirit, when he comes in the book of Acts, when, when this day comes, fire and an ability to speak a language that they had never been taught, right? Like, do you ever wonder about that? Like, why is that the first miracle? That they get this download to be able to speak a known language to somebody in their world that they didn't learn that language. I think it's because God cares so much about us communicating with other people that this part of the gift is you, you shall be my witnesses. Right? Remember? You'll, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll make inventions and make millions of dollars. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, the Holy, the Holy Spirit could certainly do that. But remember, in the Old Testament, he said, I've given you the power to get wealth in order that you might establish my covenant. <laughs> so get about the business of establishing the covenant. The ideas start dropping in. Because you might think you can handle the money, but many people have fallen into that trap. So do a good job with what you already have, and he'll give you more. Thank you. That's a hard one. <laughs> Sounds like too much work. So then... The other thing I had to do is put a question mark here because this guy looking at me and like clouds behind his head. So he's like looking down at me from up there. I'm assuming he's there. I hope he is. Going to do anything today, Pete? Got a plan to advance the kingdom? Or taking a day off? It really doesn't matter where we are, what we're doing. It could be on vacation and lead somebody to the Lord. It just, to start this fire inside of us, the Holy Spirit fire that we talk about is awesome for us, but it's also meant for a purpose, right? Holy Spirit is given to us so that we can live our lives in a way that lines up coherently with the truth of the Word of God. He'll translate Scripture for us. And you might say, well, I already know what that scripture means. Okay, but scripture in different situations can be applied differently. So we have to be careful that we don't get religious. We already said we don't like that religious spirit. When you stop thinking that you can get more revelation, bad idea. He can show you different aspects of the same scripture. Some of you are probably worrying, like, I hope he's not, I hope he's not trying to add to the Bible. He's not trying to add to the Bible but I don't want you to get lazy. Can I say that? Is that offensive? 
Thank you. Just checking. <laughs> Got a big pulpit to hide behind here. I have to. No, but, but we can all get lazy because um, it's easier. It's easier than getting up every day and fasting and praying and, you know, some of the things, the disciplines that we're being asked to do to set our sides set our lives apart for God in a way that requires discipline and delayed gratification and things that we want in the natural, but maybe there's another higher calling first. And then this ability to just abandon my own agenda, that's what he said, if you want to find your life. If you really want to find the life that was meant for you, abandon what the world tells you to do and take on the life that I give you. The rich young ruler wasn't willing to do that. He went away sad because he had many great possessions. I believe he could have got saved later. Like, we don't know. It was never addressed again. But, you know, that's how God works. It's never too late. If you've got a breath in your lungs, you could still get saved. Amen. So don't, don't worry too much about that. So anyway, the, the, hopefully that helps you understand what I'm trying to say here, that we're in this new dispensation now. Every day is a new dawning of this kingdom of regeneration. And that if I see it, apply it to myself first, then it could be contagious, which is what I'm trying to do here for all of you. And praise God, if it works, awesome. Because when we're all operating, we talked about that flourishing state this morning as we were, as we were worshiping prophetically. Flourishing means very fruitful in the Lord. You shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. Fruit in your season. Your, your leaves will never wither. What a beautiful picture of Christianity. I'll, I'll, we already read that, so I'll, I'll keep going. But in John 16, in the voice, it says, the spirit of truth will come and guide you in all truth. Personally, my wife helped me understand this at a greater level after we got married because she was spending way more time praying than I was. So she would ask the Lord first. I would think about my logical progression of decision-making, and she was right more than I was. <laughs> That's a humbling thing, right? It's just a humbling thing. I would say, I think we should do this. She'd say, no, I have a check about that, which means nothing to me. <laughs> nothing. After the 10th time, you got enough bumps on your head, like, okay, I'll wait. <laughs> and you just can't, like, you can't diminish that importance. You have not because you ask not. I would say, well, I feel like we're going to do this. And she'd say, well, what did the Lord say? I don't have to ask him about that. I'm a professional in this field. Well, then you should get a quick answer. <laughs> get it? Jeez, help us, Lord, help us. In Italian, they say, gabadost, thick head. But I married a prophet. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit will not speak his own words to you, but he will speak what he hears, revealing to you, revelation, revealing to you the things to come and bringing glory to me. <sighs> so that means if you think it's him and he's telling you to do something contrary to scripture, no, that's not bringing glory to God. Hmm. Got a lot of examples we'll skip. The Spirit has unlimited access to me. And you have unlimited access to the Holy Spirit, so you have unlimited access to Jesus. Anybody throwing a tomato at me for that one? He's in you. He has to be in you because you couldn't have said yes to Jesus without him being in you. To all that I possess and know, just as everything the Father has is mine. Thank you, Lord. That's the reason I'm confident he will care for my own. We're the flock. And Holy Spirit is here to care for us and reveal the path to us. And I needed, I needed that extra step of praying more and asking what to do. Eye has not seen, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, quoting from Isaiah in the Old Testament, eye has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's the Old Testament. Don't you love when it says, but God. Say it. But God has revealed it to them those things to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things yes the deep things of God so maybe one little post I could put up on the wall here is keep on praying keep on praying keep waiting for revelation don't be rushed into making decisions don't think that this is a no-brainer 
that that could be a big trap of the enemy. Boy, have I learned this with Trisha. Uh, instead of just booking something and telling her later, like, I'm not asking for permission. I'm asking for discernment. I want two people to agree about a decision about the church. Well, like, you know, you could say, well, the Bible says the wife's supposed to submit to the husband. And I could say, well, the husband's supposed to love the wife the way Christ loved the church. <laughs> Who's got a harder assignment? I'll let you chew on that one for a minute. Jesus is saying this to us as his disciples today. As the Father sent me, so I send you to hide in the bunker and wait until I get back. <laughs> Why is that funny? Because that's, that's that laziness factor that life just becomes so overwhelming. And I really, again, I, I've already said I'm a volunteer. I know how hard it is to juggle all this stuff. But it's possible. The Apostle Paul could be your example if you're in the marketplace. Super effective apostle for God. Still continued to make tents even when he didn't have to. And maybe it was so he could stay in touch with the lost. So that he would be reminded how much God loves the lost. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And when he said this to the disciples, he breathed on them and said to them, now this is before his ascension, after his after he resurrected, he was here for 40 days before he ascended. This is one of those times. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. And it says, now Thomas, called the twin, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, say it with me, please. We have seen the Lord. And once that happens... Once they saw the resurrected Jesus, people like Peter, who were very wishy-washy, right? And I'm not meaning to criticize him. He did step out of the boat, and I've never, I've stepped out of boats, but I sank. <laughs> right? He got a few steps in before he started sinking. So like, I'm not comparing him as some weakling, but in the, in, in the Gospels, he's, he fails often, right? And, and he felt condemned about that. But in the, in the book of Acts, oh, my God, he's a completely different person, completely changed. Once you can say, I have seen the Lord, nothing's ever the same after that again. You just don't ever want to go back to that counterfeit. And this is Thomas that said, well, I'm going to have to see it to believe it. Well, you're going to meet a lot of people like that, too. But they did see the Lord. And I love this. It says in Psalm 45 in the message, verse 4 and 5, your instructions, you're praying to the Lord. Your instructions, Lord, are glow in the dark. This is really a marketplace minister kind of thing, right? Like in the middle of my horrible day with all these secular people that don't know the Lord and greed and Wall Street and mammon is everywhere. And I'm like, I need instructions that glow in the dark because it's a dark place right here right now. And he gives them to you. Some kind of goggles to be able to see in the dark. Thank you, Lord. Your instructions are glow in the dark. You shoot sharp arrows into the enemy's hearts. The king's foes lies down in the dust, beaten. You're allowed to pray that, <laughs> but get them saved first. And then in the message also in 1 Corinthians, it says, take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the highest and the best, brightest and the best, sorry, among you. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. I'm not trying to criticize anybody here. There's some brightest and best in here. He didn't say, I don't see any. He just said, I don't see many. <laughs> Of the brightest and best among you, not many influential, not many from high, high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? Isn't that awesome? Chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Well, I don't want to witness to that guy. He has no potential. Could you imagine? God could do anything. There's not a person that was ever born that had no potential. I said it recently. I think, I don't remember, it might have been Saturday at the men's meeting. Our friend Isaac Petrie was preaching in the prison, and he said, the greatest amount of wealth is not held in the banks and the investment firms. It's held in the cemetery for all the dreams that never were accomplished, for all the visions, for all the businesses that never got started. 
And that can't be us, right? That can't be us. We've got it here. This is our window of opportunity. We jump through. True, I didn't have good credentials to get in. And Paul certainly said that over and over. It's del he deliberately chooses people to prove that he's the one doing it, not us. And I know what time it is, and you're probably getting hungry, so we'll go over and have some food. But I just want to finish. He chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. That's a word for us, okay? Let's not get up on our high horse. Let's not think of who we are. It's who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. And then he says, another one, I voluntarily become, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in the message, I voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. So again, this is the prayer that you would say to some, about somebody on your job. Lord, show me what you see about that person. Not what I see. Show me what you see about that person so that I can get the combination to the lock to know how to get behind that wall that they have. Now, my sister-in-law, Linda, let her pr pray for you because she's led so many people to the Lord on her job. It's, it's amazing, the testimonies, you know, so you'll be getting back into a, an office soon because more people need to get saved. In order to reach a, reach a wide range of people, I voluntarily laid down my high position, Paul could have said. He could have been a scholar in the best Hebrew university for the rest of his life, but he wanted to be about the Father's business. I voluntarily became a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious and non-religious, meticulous moralists and loose living immoralists. I was in the second category, just saying, so nobody's too far away from God. The defeated, the demoralized, whoever. Key, okay? Key. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ. But I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. Lisa said she had a word about compassion today. A word about empathy would be a, a cousin. That God will not only let you see what he sees, he'll let you feel the pain that they're in. And then give you the prescription that's needed right in that second, in that moment, for this person right there. And for many people, that's just an underdeveloped muscle because nobody told us that, that, that that's what we should be doing. Can we stand? And let, let's just, you know, we were going to sing a song that we didn't get to today, but um, it's called Refiner, and you've been hearing people talk about it. But it's really just saying, I want to offer my life to you. Take, take my life as a sacrifice. Clean my hands. Purify my heart. I want to burn for you, Lord. So that's really what, what Paul is saying here. You can live among sinners and not take on their way of life. You can be there on a mission for the Lord. Amen? Some of you aren't listening. You're watching. I entered into their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. Can you just meditate on that for a minute? In your life right now, who is it that you're around that's not a Christian? And can you ask the Lord, help me to see this? I want to enter their world. Doesn't mean you're sinning and, you know, I got saved out of bar bands. I was playing out in, in bar bands and I couldn't just go right back into the bar when I first got saved. But there was a time I could where I had built up enough stamina in the Lord to know that I could be there for a good reason. And I, and I had, you know, mentors, people telling me to do that. So... I can go back into that world that I knew, but I'm coming back in now with a new set of glasses. And instead of condemning them, I could just talk to them about why I, why I found a better way to go. I tried to see things from their point of view. And if you could think about that day of Acts when the Holy Spirit comes that we celebrate next week, God did this for every one of them, gave them a language to speak that they had never even learned. So if you have Holy Spirit, you can ask for that language right in the moment when you're meeting with somebody. And why wouldn't you? Even if it's your child who you know really well, there could be things in the gears of their brain that you're not getting right at that moment, right? The Lord will just intervene, let you be that conduit of heaven speaking to earth. I want that, Lord. I don't know about you all, but can we raise our hands and say, help me. Help me to get that gift, Lord, to be so discerning that I hear your voice in the moment with whoever it is that I'm speaking to and that you'll speak through me. This is what Paul said to King Agrippa, that the Lord said to him on the road to Damascus, I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles. <laughs> That's everybody. 
okay? That's the whole world. The Jewish people that, that don't like you, as well as from the Gentiles, like the people who lost their, their business when the demon got cast out of that slave girl, right? There were riots everywhere Paul went. It was either the Jews or the Gentiles that didn't like this thing. But I'm sending you to them to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Anybody willing to accept that assignment? You believe that God is sending you to do the same thing here, to open people's eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, to turn them away from the power of Satan to the power of God, to help them know that no sin that they've committed is too far away from God, that they, can, that they can't be forgiven. And the inheritance, this amazing inheritance, when you say yes to the Lord, you become adopted into his family and your name gets written into the will. You're a child of the living king for one decision that you make. The thief on the cross never went to a church service, never got baptized. We don't know too much about him, but he did something in order to be put to death. All he said was, remember me, Lord. Doesn't sound very complicated, does it? Something happened in his heart, and he recognized who Jesus was, and that was enough even in the last moment, but why wait? Look at this, my eyes can be opened. I'm turning from darkness to light. The power of Satan is flushed out of my life and the power of God comes in. I'm, I'm forgiven so that I can then forgive other people and I receive this amazing inheritance surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses for thousands of years, Christians that have gone before me, motivate me, heroic people that did way beyond what their natural capabilities would have allowed them to do. And now I'm part of that family, sanctified in him. And I'm just going to end here. It's not the normal place you would hear a, a sermon in, but it's good because Paul is, Paul received a place in his life where he said, you know what? I'm never going to fully arrive. This is my conjecture, but I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to keep pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high calling, right? I haven't arrived, but I'm going to keep pressing. And he said, now for the third time, I'm ready to come to you and I will not be burdensome to you. You know what he meant there? Money. I'm not going to ask you for offerings. Now, you can look at that up another time, but that was important. I'm going to come to you and I'm not meaning to be a burden. I'm not asking for support. For I don't seek your money. I seek you. <laughs> That's a pretty clean heart, wouldn't you say? For the children, the people in the pews, aren't supposed to save up for the parents, the leaders who are doing the teaching. The parents are supposed to save up for the children, right? So we're here to serve you. And if you forget that, just look here. <laughs> Can't be any clearer. I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. That's a hard thing to say, isn't it? I will very gladly spend and be spent. What a great testimony. That sounds like Jesus talking, doesn't it? And then he ends it by saying, though the more I love you, the less you love me in return. I just ran out of room. <laughs> so can we lift our hands one more time? I know I asked you to do this already. But Lord, I thank you for this amazing tribe, that King of Kings, people that clearly have made a decision to go the extra mile to serve you, to be in a culture that's not as concerned about meeting a schedule as to hearing your voice and to, and to just receive the commissioning that you want to give each one of us every day. That we're at the dawning every day of this new kingdom, regeneration, regenesis. Every day it's a fresh start to do the next thing that you're asking us to do. And instead of us feeling overwhelmed by that, Lord, we want to get excited about it. And I pray that you would transfer that excitement into the hearts of your people as we dwell on this gift of Holy Spirit being poured out on the whole planet that we celebrate next Sunday. We want to be actively engaged with your Spirit, with your Son, as your Son, and you being our Father that we would get the full measure of everything that you have for us. I bless your people as being obedient servants to do that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now we can all eat and drink coffee. We even are going to have...
the prayer ministry over there. If, if you need prayer, we're not going to do it here because we're going to go over there and we'll have session two on that side and you can get some food and something to drink. Love you all.